Welcome to Sammy J's audio on Books channel. Your go-to plug for all genres of Sammy J novels audio narrations that will keep you yearning for more. Please subscribe and turn on post notification to get alerts on all new audiobooks upload. Her Sweet Surrender A steamy second chance romance novel by Sammy J, narrated by James Garner. Chapter 1 the last time Jesse Buchanan had seen Thomas Blue Miller, he'd been walking out of her life. He'd left her standing in the middle of a long gravel road, left her looking through watery eyes at shoulders too broad to belong to a boy of 18, at legs longer than she'd ever realized, when she'd felt them heavy and warm and tangled naked with her own. For ten years now, she'd revisited the mental image, wondering what Blue had been thinking, his head held so high after she'd told him that, no, love wasn't enough of a reason for her to stay, wasn't enough of a reason to spend her life in a town that, in 18 years, had never felt like home. He had felt like home, but he'd been bound to September, Texas, by ties she'd never been able to understand. Get over it, Jess. The ties were unbreakable. Blue never had any intention of living anywhere but in the one town you couldn't wait to put behind you. And if that fundamental difference wasn't the foundation for a doomed relationship, then she hadn't learned much since leaving. Of course, there was always the possibility she hadn't learned anything at all, considering she was back here in September and on her way to see Blue. Approaching the railroad crossing at the city limits, Jessie slowed her low-slung sports car. Remembering how many unsuspecting oil pans had met their fate on the seemingly mild-mannered bump in the road, the locals knew better than to take the lazy rise at face value because of its wicked backside drop. Crawling up and over the tracks, she coasted to a stop at the first of the city's two traffic lights. The fact that she knew when and where to drive with caution didn't sit all that well, Taking the girl out of the country had apparently been more of a sure thing than wringing the country from the girl. Not that September was exactly a world away from Dallas, her home for six years now. It just seemed that way, she thought, as the light changed and the car purred into town. What with Soup's auto, located immediately and conveniently between the tracks and the traffic signal, the diamond dollar on the far end of the next block, City Hall on the near side, and the mayor's house, smack dab in between. The town resembled so many of the other dots on the map she'd driven through since leaving her condo at noon, but subtle nuances still separated September from the others. Nuances noticeable only by a native, or a long-lost daughter returning home. No, not returning. Never returning. Visiting. This was a short vacation and nothing more. Still, she could hardly deny that 18 years spent in this town gave meaning to the places she drove past. Places like Miller's Feed and Supply. The white frame building sat alone at the far end of town, the location allowing for the constant flow of stock trailers and dual-axle pickups without getting in the way of folks needing to get to the post office or to Debbie Does hairdos or to the First Baptist Church on Wednesday nights. And behind the wooden structure loomed a thoroughly modern and huge barn-red barn. Jesse knew from her internet research that Blue was doing all right for himself. The addition to the original location now served as Miller's regional supply center, warehousing the stock for the extremely profitable chain of family-owned stores. She had to admit a bit of a thrill, however, Seeing that the business's first structure still stood, little changed since the days Blue had chased her up and down the aisles, letting her twist free when he caught her, until neither of them had the will to wait one minute more. Jessie shivered, pushing the thought away, or at least giving it her best shot. But memories of Blue's naked body, memories of being as physically close to him as a woman could possibly be to a man, Memories of her head on his chest, her hand deep between his legs, his arm wrapped around her with such desperation that their bodies seemed more one than two. 
were not easily buried, especially when those very memories had brought her here. It was late in the day, at least by September Texas standards, yet Jessie kept her sunglasses in place, deflecting both the final rays of the setting sun and the curious glances that attract her westward progress through town. Now nothing lay ahead but the highway that would take her to Blue and his Christmas tree farm. If anything in her snooping surprised her, the discovery that Blue had converted 20 of the Miller's homestead 60 acres did, though having read about the Virginia pine growing and harvesting timetable, she supposed he'd had his father's help in the venture's launch. The year-old profile she'd searched out in the Texas Monthly online archives mentioned that Anne and Phil Miller had retired to the dry Arizona desert, leaving the family business in the very capable hands of their only son, Blue Miller, CEO. Jesse smiled. With September in her rearview mirror, she scanned the road ahead for the cutoff to the Miller place. When she'd left for four years at Wellesley, financed by her maternal grandmother's trust, Blue had been on his way to Stephen F. Austin and a business degree. It was nice to see the proof of his success. She knew how much his parents had sacrificed to ensure their only son's future. The most intriguing thing her research had uncovered, however, was the fact that Blue had never married. An online issue of the county newspaper featuring an article on his Christmas tree farm had labeled him one of the area's most eligible bachelors. But the issue had been five months old, and Jesse hadn't wanted to take a chance on showing up if his status had changed. To that end, she'd bribed her marketing department's administrative assistant with a week's worth of lunches to give him a call. They'd concocted a story that the radio station where Jesse worked as an account executive was considering a Christmas promo involving a weekend stay at a local B&B topped off with the selection of a live Christmas tree. Would he mind if they sent one of their people out to tour his place? Such a visit, of course, would be arranged not to interfere with his family life. Blue had obligingly let slip that he had no family locally and lived on his own, setting Jesse's plan into action. As driven as she knew Blue to be, as passionate about life, she had a hard time believing he'd have chosen celibacy over a committed relationship. That left her believing, hoping, that his sexual involvements were casual. For her plan to work, she needed him to be open to her suggestion that they warm up the season by creating a few new Christmas memories. Blue Miller had been the best sex she'd ever had. She'd come back to find out if he still was. Chapter 2 One of these days, Blue decided, he really did need to learn to say no. Why the hell a Dallas radio station thought any of their listeners would want to make a trip to September for a Christmas tree was beyond him. But marketing wasn't his thing, and he'd agreed to meet with the rep from the radio station before thinking the idea all the way through. At least nothing legal or binding had been signed. Turning on to his long, winding drive, he wondered again why he hadn't called this whole thing off days ago. Hell... It was barely a month until Christmas. The station's contact name and number were scratched right there on the chalkboard back in his store office. Yet when he'd finally looked up this afternoon from the tons of work still waiting, he'd realized the rep would have left Dallas hours before. He'd had no choice but to save his spreadsheet, shut down his laptop, grab his coat, and hit the road. And obviously it was even later than he thought. He grumbled grunting as his pickup bounced through the gate and into the clearing surrounding the house. An electric blue Mercedes-Benz compressor sat parked alongside the covered wraparound porch. Feeling perversely inconvenienced, he parked directly behind it, catching a flash of movement near the porch swing before climbing down from the cab. He had a buttload of orders to see to for Miller's annual New Year's deals, he should be spending the evening at work, not putting on a show of the nice Christmas tree farmer at home. 
When his father asked about the delay in orders, Blue would remind the older man whose idea it was four years ago to plant all those damn pine seedlings, and who hadn't ended up sticking around to see the venture through. With his work boots crunching on the crushed shell drive, Blue headed for the porch steps, determined to send the station's rep packing and get his own butt back to the store. Sorry I'm late, he said, mounting the four steps in two strides. I got caught up at the office. But that was all of his hit-the-road spiel he had time to get out before coming face to face with his past. Jesse Buchanan had grown into a hell of a woman. She wore black leather, black silk, and black denim, a motorcycle jacket, a low-cut t-shirt, and tight, skinny jeans. Her skin was as porcelain pale as ever, her eyes brilliantly knowing. Her toenails were painted a deep, lush red. She had on the strangest-looking pair of heeled sandals he'd ever seen, lace-up and velvet and black. But she didn't seem to have noticed the cold at all. She looked nothing like the girl he remembered, the girl who'd turned his gut inside out when she'd licked her lips and begged. Not for what she wanted. It had never been about what she wanted. It had always been about what she wanted to do. For him. To him. He choked back the memory, took the last step onto the porch, and stopped. He wondered what she was up to. He wondered if he wanted to know. Fists shoved into his jeans pockets, and shoulders hunched forward. He acknowledged her with no more than the suggestion of a nod. Jess? Hi, Blue. She walked toward him, her hips swaying in that same seductive walk he'd seen for years in his dreams. You're looking good. She looked better than good. She looked like the breakfast he craved when he rolled out of bed, the rich dessert he never took time to savor. He lived on fast food and coffee, his life having become a series of quickies when his back had been turned. And now here was Jesse Buchanan, looking like a bad girl who understood quickies well. The thought stirred the primitive heat, seeing her had kindled deep between his legs. It's the air. He pulled in a huge breath. The clean country living. It does a body good. You're full of shit, she said, and moved even closer. You always were. And I see you're still a mouthy little thing. Only she wasn't so little at all. She wasn't any taller. She just seemed so. Her presence, that of a lioness, confident, proud. Where once she'd been more mousy and meek, skittish and easily cowed. Except with him. Never with him. And then she was in his arms, saying hello with her body and smelling like the sunshine missing from these dreary winter days. His arms went around her waist, hers wrapped around his neck. He nuzzled his face to her hair and breathed deeply, remembering, reliving, aching from more than the press of her thighs to his, her belly to his, her breasts to his chest, where his heart had started to thunder. He stepped back and set her away, holding her upper arms because he didn't want her to bolt just yet, and wasn't sure if she'd broken herself of the habit. And then he found himself shaking his head. This woman, this Jessie, bolting looked to be the farthest thing from her mind. Long, dark lashes swept down, swept up, her eyes as green as he remembered, as green as pine seedlings soaking up summer's sun, as green as winter's harvest of Christmas trees. The trees? God damn it. She was here because of the Christmas trees. He released her as if he'd been felled by an axe. The victorious look on her face confirmed his suspicion. You're from the radio station, aren't you? Her growing smile stirred the coals of his wariness. He moved back into her space, towering above her, glaring down. What the hell's going on? She ran a hand through her silky black hair, shoving it back from her face. She licked her lips and started to turn away. He wasn't going to let it happen. They were separated now by ten inches, not ten years. And he held home field advantage. 
He reached out, ran his hand along the side of her neck, his fingers into the hair at her nape, and cupped the back of her skull. I'm waiting here, Jess. I want an answer. She nodded, a smile playing along the line of her lips, slick from the touch of her tongue and tinted the same red as her toes. You used to be more trusting, he snorted. I used to be 18. So did I, she said, turning her face to press her lips, the tip of her tongue, the barest edge of her teeth, to the inside of his forearm. We're both older now, Blue, and hopefully more than a little bit wiser. His pride ordered him to let her go. His cock, which remembered that warm and wet mouth, told him to pull her body to his. Being wiser is the reason I don't trust you. If you set this up, if you set me up, so help me, I'll... You'll do what? Turn me over your knee? Why did she look like that's exactly what she wanted him to do? Not 15 minutes ago, he'd been working on a plan to get out of this deal with the radio station. Now the idea didn't seem like the same waste of time. Except he knew that's exactly what it was. He couldn't work with this woman. Fuck her, yeah. But deal with her professionally? Keep their contact strictly business when she was the last person on earth he'd have invited back into his life? He hated her even more now that she was standing here, her lips parted and her breathing labored, making him forget why he had never wanted to see her again. He needed to remember her leaving, the way she had given but half of the story, never telling him the whole truth. He tilted her head back, stared directly down into her eyes. His pulse roared in his ears, and in his pants, where his non-thinking head wanted a rough and raw pounding revenge. I think you'd better get back in that fancy import of yours and get the hell back to Dallas before you regret having come here. You haven't even heard my proposal yet. She caught at her lower lip with her teeth, once, twice. The fog of breath she exhaled surrounded him, a warm cocoon in the rapidly frosting air. It was all Blue could do not to slide his hand into her panties and see if she was as slick and wet as the look in her eyes promised. I don't need to hear it. This Christmas tree thing isn't going to happen. There's only one thing that ever worked between us, Jess. But I don't think you're ready to sleep with me. Think again. Chapter 3 his eyes flared. That was the only way she knew to describe the flash of fire that consumed her where she stood. His grip on her head tightened, and Jesse wondered if she would survive the force of his body when it finally slid into hers. When she'd made the decision to head for September, she'd never expected to find the boy she'd last seen. But she sure as hell hadn't expected to find Blue Miller to be such a large, compelling, and dangerous threat. Wait a minute. Are you saying the radio station promo story is bullshit? He skipped right over the part about her being here to sleep with him, and he snorted. You don't give a shit about the trees. You don't even work for the station, do you? No, I mean, yes, I do. Deep breath, Jesse, deep breath. She'd never pull this off if she kept stumbling over her words. If he thought she was still the girl who'd run, who hadn't possessed the backbone to stay and bring her father up on charges of abuse. And I am here because of the station's Christmas promo. It's just not... Just not what? He let her go then, took a step back, and dragged a palm down his face before settling both hands on his hips. Just not a promo that has anything to do with my trees. Do you mind if we go inside? I'll explain everything. I swear. She shivered and told herself the night fog rolling in off the fields and surrounding the house was the cause. It's too cold out here to talk. Oh, yeah, sure. He dug his keys from his front pocket and headed for the door. Sorry, I wasn't thinking. I was waiting for you to take off your clothes. She glared at his back. Very funny. Hey, he shrugged. You said you were here to sleep with me. 
Sleeping wasn't exactly what I had in mind, Blue, though I'd be more than happy to share your bed for the weekend. She made the offer to his broad back. He froze, stiffened, then pushed open the door, letting off a muttered string of curses both raw and foul. She ducked beneath his outstretched arm, dragging fingertips over his sculpted abs as she passed, amazed by the strength in his body, amazed by her own strength of will, the steadiness of her voice. Hugging herself tightly against a case of the jitters that she hoped passed for cold, she walked to the center of the front room. The furniture had changed, as had the color scheme and the decor, but still she knew this house better than the one she'd grown up in. Never had she felt the same sense of things being right and safe as she had when here with the Millers. Even now, tendrils of clinging nostalgia remained. Blue shut the door and turned the deadbolt. The thud echoed from her jaw to her toes. You're assuming a lot here, Jess. Like the fact that there's room in my bed. Why? Are you sleeping in a twin size these days? She glanced toward the staircase that had once led to his room, before turning to face him. That never posed a problem before. His pulse ticked in the vein at his temple. I wasn't talking about the size of my bed. You live here alone, right? He nodded. Are you expecting company tonight? He shook his head. Then I'm not sure I see the problem. I'm talking about sex. Now to get the messy past out of the way so they could get down to business. It's not like I'm asking you to marry me. No, you wouldn't. We both know how you feel about marrying me. Pushing away from the front door, he shrugged out of his denim jacket and tossed it over the back of the sofa. Then he headed to the kitchen, leaving her with a look that made his feelings about her ten-year-old rejection quite clear. Her eyes stinging, she watched him go, his shoulders as broad as she remembered, his legs as powerful and long. She'd hurt him, yes, but still her body responded. Her breasts swelled. Her body quickened, yet hesitation crept in. She told herself, while concocting her plan, that her motives were all about reliving the sex. She hadn't wanted to face or discover the truth, that Thomas Miller was the only man capable of making her body respond. But reality paced the tiled floor in the kitchen, banging cabinet doors, blasting water from the faucet, abruptly shutting off the flow. Jessie waited, letting blue steam and letting the coffee brew before she followed. She left her leather jacket on the couch next to his, brave enough now to face him wearing the low-cut and long-sleeved t-shirt she'd bought with this reunion in mind. She wore no bra, and 5% lycra gave a clingy oomph to the rich black silk. Blue had loved her breasts more than any other part of her body. She knew she wasn't playing fair, dressing to remind him of that fact, but she wanted him to remember what she couldn't forget, the way he'd buried his face against them, the way he'd sucked her, the way he'd straddled her chest, pressed her breasts together, and repeatedly shoved his cock between them. His face had grown strained, Veins standing rigid along his neck with his effort to hold back, to wait. He'd failed, accepting the invitation of her open mouth every single time. Oh boy, she thought, and took a deep breath, wiping sweaty palms on her thighs before stepping from hardwood onto the kitchen floor, tiled in colors of senna and earth. Blue stood in profile, hands braced on the black marble countertop, shoulders hunched as he stared at the coffee streaming from basket to pot. She wanted to go to him. She ached to hold him. The need to tell him again that she'd loved him wrapped vice-like fingers around her heart. But then he straightened, and he looked at her, and she thanked God that she hadn't said a word or made a move toward him. His eyes were cold and hurt, and he wasn't in the mood for sympathy or soothing. He certainly wasn't in the mood for sex. 
One cup, he ground out. One cup and you're gone. The caffeine will get you back to Dallas. I'm not going back to Dallas tonight. Fine. There's a Motel 6 on the interstate, and the kettle next door serves ham and sweet potatoes every night. She clamped down on the need to tell him what she could easily show him instead. Her heels clicked against the smart Italian tile on her way across the room. She kept her gaze locked on his, looking away only long enough to reach up into the cupboard for a mug. The one she set next to the pot would easily hold a quart. One of Blue's dark brows went up. You drink that much, you'd better get a room. You'll be needing to take a piss every ten minutes. And between here and Dallas, you're out of luck. So I'll get a room. Whatever. She wasn't going back to Dallas. Not with all the excuses she'd made, begging off from parties and intimate dinners to free up this weekend. Suit yourself, he said with a shrug and poured. Jessie wrapped both hands around her mug and brought it to her mouth, blowing across the surface before she sipped. The flavor was earthy and rich, and, coffee snob that she was, she knew it hadn't come pre-packaged off the Maxi Mart shelf. She wasn't completely successful keeping a smile from her face. I didn't know you could get coffee like this in September. You can't, Blue sipped and grimaced at the burn. I pick it up, coming through Palestine or Tyler. Wow, I don't believe it. Thomas Miller admitting he can't get everything he wants living the good life in September. She backed across the width of the narrow kitchen and leaned against the counter opposite from Blue. He refused to rise to her bait. What gives, Jess? What's the story? She set her coffee aside and, hands on the counter's edge, boosted herself up on top. Leaning forward, she swung her legs, crossed at the ankles, and stared at the floor beneath her dangling feet. The station is doing a Christmas promo. It's a home for the holidays contest. Several listeners will win airfare and lodging and rental car packages, enabling them to visit family they don't have the funds to see. I don't get it. You don't have any family here. Blue said softly. I know. I wouldn't be here if I did. She wondered if the citizens of September knew where her father had gone, or what he'd done to deserve the sentence that would keep him locked up for good. She blinked and shuddered the thought away. Anyway, I work for the station. I'm not eligible to win, but the promo got me to thinking about September. About you. And about how the man in Dallas she'd been dating left her cold when Blue had left her breathless. He was the only one who ever had. Can't be too popular a promo, he scoffed, sending people places they never wanted to see again. She refused to let his sarcasm faze her. I didn't want to see September. I wanted to see you. I wanted this Christmas to be one we would both remember. She could have said more. She could have started taking off her clothes, but she didn't. She waited, and waited, watching tendrils of steam curl upward from the mug he held at chest level. He stood with his work boots crossed at the ankle, one palm heeled down on the countertop, fingers curled over the edge. The sleeves of his blue and green plaid flannel were rolled back, those of his cream-colored thermal undershirt pushed up. His forearms were thick and muscled, covered with hair a shade or two lighter than the dark brown strands, caught up in the back by his shirt collar. She'd never known him to wear his hair long, and her fingers itched to feel the texture, to unbutton his shirt and pull the tail free from his worn denim jeans, to bare his skin slowly. She wanted to taste his throat, to nuzzle the pit of his arm, his navel, the thatch of hair that cushioned his sex. She wanted to remind him how good they'd once been. And she wanted, needed, to prove that once was the operative word, that she'd inflated their connection beyond the simple sexual compatibility that it was, that Blue couldn't offer her anything more, that she still didn't love him. 
Coffee's getting cold, he finally said. She didn't even look down at her cup. Can I get a refill? He shook his head. Not part of the deal, Jess. Sorry. The kitchen clock tick, tick, ticked through several long seconds before she sighed and picked up her mug. She wasn't ready to give up. Not yet. Not when she hadn't accomplished what she'd come here to do. She had to know what was truth and what was fiction. She needed answers so she would know what to do with the rest of her life. When Blue suddenly pushed away from the counter and walked out of the kitchen, she set down her mug without drinking. He returned seconds later, carrying an antique oak bar stool with a curved spindle back. He set it directly in front of her and sat, lifting both of her feet to his lap. She took a deep breath and waited. Chapter 4 He couldn't help himself. He was going to take her to bed. He was tired and hungry. He needed to work. He needed to sleep. But the only thing that mattered was taking care of his basis needs. The teeth of the zipper closing his fly were rapidly reaching their limits. He could get back to hating the both of them later. Besides, he'd been seven kinds of stupid to waste a good heart on when he had Jesse Buchanan sitting in his kitchen with her legs spread. Jessie, the girl who'd said yes to every single thing he'd asked her to do when she'd been naked, and he'd been brick-busting hard. Her curiosity, her willingness, her uninhibited nature had never ceased to amaze him. Blue? Hmm? What are you doing? What he was doing was unlacing the strings of the funkiest pair of shoes he'd ever seen. That and hoping when he stood up again, his cock didn't break off at the root. God damn, but he was hard. The way you're drinking, you're going to be a while finishing that cup. I see. So, you're playing the gracious host and seeing to your guest's comfort? Is that it? She lifted her coffee with both hands, spreading her fingers to hold the mug's deep bowl, taking her time settling the rim at her mouth, before she sipped. Blue's hands stilled on her feet. He remembered too well the strength in her slender fingers, the pressure of her fingertips, as she'd played between his legs, teasing the head of his cock, stroking the shaft, fondling his balls before reaching behind in the territory no woman since had cared to explore. He remembered, too, the temptation of her mouth, the way she held her lips slightly parted, the way she'd never been able to keep her tongue from flicking out for missed drops of whatever it was she'd been drinking. Her mouth was the mouth of his fantasies, and nothing about that had changed. He turned his attention back to her feet, looking for the equilibrium he'd lost now that he'd given himself permission to indulge. She didn't make it easy on a man. No, Jess, that's not it. I'm actually seeing to my comfort, he said, wanting to add to hell with yours. But knowing sex between them wasn't worth the effort if she wasn't having fun. Her enthusiasm was the bar by which he judged all others, and the reason he'd let his insistent cock win tonight. He hadn't had a good fuck in months. Oh she finally said as she lowered her mug, slowly looking up and into his eyes as her tongue cleared a drop of coffee from her mouth. Lower lip caught between her teeth, she sat up as straight as her spine allowed and poured the rest of the liquid into the sink. What can I do to help? He finished unlacing and removing both of her shoes, and then he sat back. Hands wrapped around her ankles, holding her bare feet in place on his thighs. She looked like pleasing him right now was the only thing that mattered in her life. And he wondered how in the hell he was supposed to respond. His heels hooked on the barstool's rung. He spread his legs. Hers spread with the movement. He shifted his thighs farther apart, opening hers even wider. 
He wished she was wearing a skirt without panties. Or, better yet, nothing but a garter holding thigh-high stockings in place. He wanted to sit here with her naked pussy at eye level. The dark hair, the pink lips, the glistening juices he knew tasted of salt. The longer he watched, the wetter she'd get. Already he imagined her scent, imagined pushing her back on her elbows, pulling her bottom forward into his mouth. His first impulse was to take his time, but he saw no need to wait, no need to hold back, no need to make nice and pretty pillow talk when he wasn't feeling the least bit nice and didn't plan to bother with a pillow. He wanted to be damn sure she knew where they stood. This was nothing but the sex she'd come here looking for. He gave a slight nod. You can take off your shirt and show me those fantastic tits you've been teasing me with. He knew she wouldn't refuse. After all, she'd claimed she was here for this very reason. What he hadn't expected, however, was the triumphant gleam that came into her eyes or the calculated way that she stripped. She took her sweet time reaching for her shirt hem, lifting it up to bear the bottom curves of her beautifully full breasts. He couldn't look away, as she obviously knew, because she was damn sure putting on a show. He waited and waited, sweat gathering in the hollow of his throat, as he continued to wait and to watch. Higher and higher went the hem of her shirt, lifting the tits he so wanted to see until, suddenly, her shirt was over her head and off, her breasts bouncing, her hair whipping around her shoulders. Her coloring came straight from an artist's palette, inky black hair with blue highlights, china doll porcelain skin, nipples as dark red as Merlot. She moved her hands to her legs then, running her palms and spread fingers down her inner thighs. The movement of her arms pressed her breasts together. He knew exactly how sweet and how tight the fit between them would be. Her nipples pebbled, begging him to drop his pants and thrust into the soft valley she'd made. It was all he could do not to come where he sat. When she slid her feet up his legs until they met in a V on either side of his crotch, when she pushed down with her heels against his inner thighs in the exact spot she knew to apply pressure, he closed his eyes and groaned. None of the things he wanted to do with her were going to happen if he didn't get up. Spending the rest of the night taking advantage of her offer, it seemed like a good idea at the time. But things were moving too fast. At this rate, he'd go off in 30 seconds. He wanted to blame his rapid response on the fact that he'd been celibate for too long. But the truth was, he'd always been this way with Jessie. He pushed up from the bar stool, dislodging her feet. She crossed her legs up beneath her, limber even in jeans. Yeah, he was about to be in big trouble. Especially when Jessie's gaze lifted slowly to his from where she'd been staring at the bulge behind his fly. Her eyes widened and sparkled and spoke of a hunger he'd never known another woman to feel. A hunger he knew would consume them both in the sort of sexual feast he'd been starving for. Take a break, Miller. Get some air. Easy for you to say. He grumbled to his pious inner voice. It was his outer self calling these shots. But even his cock knew when distance was necessary. I want you to do something for me, Jess. What? She asked, though she might as well have said anything. Because that's what his body heard. Take off your jeans, but leave on your panties. And he gestured toward the floor. Put your shoes back on, then meet me on the back porch. She unfolded herself from the countertop and slid to the floor, as if she'd been waiting all this time for him to tell her what to do. Blue couldn't help it. He took two steps and backed her into the counter, pressing his erection into the soft give of her belly and covering her weighty breasts with his hands. 
Her nipples pressed into his palms like gumdrops, and she tossed back her head. Eyes closed, she gave a long, throaty sigh of what sounded like joyful relief. Amazing. Absolutely amazing. He dropped his hands as if he'd been burned, turned and left the kitchen, walking into the attached washroom, and then pushing open the screen door leading to the back porch. He didn't want to witness her feeling anything resembling joy or relief or emotion of any kind. It was hard enough seeing the way she wanted him. With the cool, damp fog swirling round, he jerked his shirt tail from his jeans, wincing as he unzipped his fly and reached into his tight cotton boxers for the source of his pleasure and pain. And then he spit into his palm and began to stroke getting rid of the intense initial rush of arousal so he could take the time he was going to need with Jesse. Chapter 5 When Blue demanded she strip to her panties, Jesse never considered telling him no. It wasn't until he told her to add the shoes that she'd suffered a stirring of doubt. High heels and a thong were so not her thing. Now, however, with her sandals laced and her thong covering only a little bit more than nothing, what she suffered wasn't doubt, but a sharp anticipation, a biting sense of heightened nerves and need. For the first time in her life, she got it. That thing she'd never before understood about the way a man saw a woman when she wore nothing but heels and lingerie. It was a basic response. A primal reaction, the male of the species, tempted by his female's posture, drawn to mate by the lift of her ass, the length of her legs, the thrust of her breasts, the arch of her back. Standing in Blue's kitchen, in nothing but a black satin thong and three-inch heels of black velvet, Jessie had never been more aware of her body, and yet... What she felt was truly unique to this moment. This man, her man, who was waiting to see her with her feathers flaunted and spread. Her imagination went wild, dreaming of blue at her back, his erection pressed between the cheeks of her bottom, his hands cupping the heft of her breasts, rubbing down over her belly to the barely there strip of hair beneath the edge of her thong, his skin rough and calloused on hers, so pampered and soft. She shivered at her body's response, the tightening of her nipples, the moisture that dampened her thighs, the beat of her heart, like hummingbird wings fluttering inside her ribs, the pulse of energy buzzing along the surface of her skin, raising the hair on her arms, tightening the coil of desire holding her belly taut, Nothing in her life before this had ever seemed so right, so meant to be. No, she wasn't 100% comfortable with the idea of walking outside wearing nothing but a tiny scrap of fabric. At least he had no neighbors for miles. But she wanted Blue badly enough that she knew she'd comply. Especially now that she was here, now that she'd seen him, been touched by him, now that she was forced to accept that she needn't go any further for the answer to her question. The truth was she responded to Blue like no other man. Understanding why would not change that reality. Accepting it, however, meant she had choices to make about any relationships in her future. Right now, however, she chose to give in to the mystery and the needs of both her body and Blue's. She found him leaning both hands on a thigh-high porch railing. Fog swirled low on the ground, eclipsing the fields beyond the clearing. A touch of light spilled through the windows, and the security spotlight on the highest eave of the house cast a surreal halo over the whole of the landscape. Jessie shivered because she was cold, and because desire drove a powerful bargain. Her nipples pebbled into painful knots, and she hugged herself tightly, running her hands up and down her goose-fleshed arms for what warmth the friction provided. Her heels clicked on the porch. 
Blue didn't so much as turn his head. She had no idea what was going on in his mind, and decided she'd be better off not knowing. There was no need to involve heart and soul when all she wanted to do was prove nothing but the sex remained between them. Before we go any further, I need you to do something for me. She'd do it herself, but, well, she wasn't exactly dressed for the hike to her car, parked beneath the yard's security spotlight. There's a bag in my front seat and a box of condoms in the bag. The car's unlocked. She knew he'd heard her join him, but he didn't even look around when she made her request. All he did was blow out a snort and ask, Covering all your bases? Actually, she was, though he sounded more put out than thrilled with the concept. What had he expected? That she announce her intentions to all of September? I thought it best to come prepared. Buying condoms at Blossom Drugs never did remain a private affair. To that, Blue had no comeback. He just walked off the back steps and headed for her car. She listened, waiting for the crunch of his boots on the crushed shell drive, the sound of her car door slamming shut. And then she listened for his return, for any sort of sound, his breathing, the scrape of denim against denim as he walked. Even the winter-dead grass crunching beneath his feet as he passed. Standing in the shelter of the doorway on the covered porch, she heard nothing beyond the beat of her heart. When he rounded the corner, he kept walking, signaling for her to follow him out into the yard. She hesitated briefly, not particularly thrilled by the idea of walking naked into the yard, but realizing she had no need to worry. She trusted Blue not to put her in an untenable situation. He might dislike her for the way she'd left him, but he was not a cruel man. No matter how the years had changed him, malice was beyond his nature. Pulling in a steadying breath, she made her way carefully across the mat of brown grass, carpeting the clearing behind the house. Blue waited at the cedar plank door to a structure he'd built since her last visit here. His gaze devoured her body as she drew closer to the dark corner of the yard. She wanted him to look into her eyes and see her intention to meet boldly any challenge he issued. She was no violet, shrinking away to wither and wilt. Neither would she creep back in the direction she'd come, tail tucked between her legs because he'd widened his eyes and said, Boo! Facing him now was nothing compared to the day ten years ago when she'd gathered up what guts she'd managed to salvage and left him, setting out to rebuild the spirit crushed by her father's abuse and reclaim her right to live her own life fearlessly before involving herself and another's. But instead of meeting her defiant gaze, he studied the shoes on her feet, shaking his head as she walked, his eyes moving upward the closer she came. His gaze took in her legs, lingered at her silky black thong, slid over her belly, stopped at her breasts. She stopped as well, standing inches away beneath his outstretched arm, which held open the door to what she realized was an outdoor sauna, housing a shower and hot tub. The idea of having blue wet and naked and warm, with the sky above clearing and the stars beginning to shine. Her pulse doubled its already frantic pace. She stepped up onto the concrete floor and turned into the enclosure to find a light fixture matching the one from the porch, a cedar plank bench, and a long row of clothes hooks. Blue followed her inside. The door shut behind him, and he shoved the deadbolt home. She perched gingerly on the edge of the bench, crossed one leg over the other, and leaned down to unlace her shoes. Her fingertips had barely grazed the laces before he ordered her to stop. Slowly, she got back to her feet, feeling strangely lightheaded by how small the space seemed now that he'd locked them inside feeling equally off-balance by the hovering presence of the man for whom she'd shed both clothes and inhibitions. 
He loomed larger than her memories painted him as she looked up into his eyes. These will ruin if they get wet. They won't get wet. Jaw clenched tight. Blue's hands went to the buttons on his shirt. I'll take them off. Nodding was all she was able to do while she watched him shrug out of his flannel. He tossed it over a hook, then sat to remove his boots. She wasn't sure what to do, but she was desperate to touch him, to run her hands across his shoulders, to slide her palms down his chest, to spread her fingers over his stomach, to stroke his penis, to cup his balls, to take him into her mouth. Damn it, Jesse, he said, shoving his boots up beneath the bench. He whipped his undershirt over his head and off, then looked at her and glared. Don't look at me like that and expect me not to give you what you're asking for. Shivers threatened to take her apart. He sat there half naked, so beautiful in his anger and arousal, his muscles flexed, his jaw rigid, his pulse ticking in the vein at his temple. She had never wanted to feel him inside of her more than she did right now. She moved directly in front of him and placed one heel gently onto the edge of the bench between his spread thighs. All I'm asking is for you to take off my shoes. His hands hovered over the laces at her ankle, but his gaze burned straight ahead. She felt the heat between her legs where the scrap of her thong revealed more than it covered now that she stood with her knee bent and leg raised. Swearing under his breath, Blue tore his gaze away, deftly unlacing the wickedly expensive shoe, pulling it from her foot and tucking it safely into the far corner of the bench. When she made a move to step back and switch feet, he stopped her with a strong hand circling her ankle and held her there, saying nothing as his breathing grew ragged and rough. She waited, expecting him to touch her intimately, wanting, aching, anticipating the slide of his finger into her sex. His hand began to move upward, over her calf to her knee, and she trembled so violently she thought she would fall. Blue never said a word. He only continued his agonizingly slow upward progress. Once past her knee, he spread his fingers, mapping a path along her inner thigh, and then stopping, damn it, stopping. Stopping with his fingertips, barely brushing the dip where her leg ended, and sensation began. She closed her eyes and shuddered, opened them again and moved her bare foot to the floor, the other to the bench between Blue's spread legs. On these laces, he wasted no time, and in seconds, she was left wearing nothing but her thong. Turn around, Blue ordered, and she did. Back up here, he added, and again she complied, holding her breath until she felt the brush of fingertips up the backs of her thighs to her bottom. She held her clutched hands between her breasts, wondering how she would survive this night when she wanted to weep with the waiting, and when she knew this would not be the only night she would cry, wanting Blue Miller's touch. At the creak of the bench, she tensed further, then gasped at the feel of his mouth, his lips nibbling the fleshy cheeks of her bottom, his teeth taking tiny nips of her skin, his tongue slipping beneath the elastic band of her thong and following it down her crevice. His hands gripped her hips and urged her to step closer before the palm he moved to the small of her back pressed her down. She bent at the waist. Her hands on her thighs kept her steady as Blue wedged a knee between her legs and spread her apart. She heard the click of a pocket knife, briefly felt the cold blade before he sliced through the silk once, twice. The thong fell to her feet and then his hands seemed to be everywhere at once, her spine, her thighs, her bottom, deep between her legs where one long index finger separated her labia. She ached, she burned, and he did nothing but circle the tiny bud of hardened flesh 
before pulling away to spread the moisture that seeped from her core. He pushed into her then, the blunt tip of one finger seeking out and finding the soft pillow of her G-spot inside. He rubbed and stroked, pulled out and pushed in, one finger first, then with two, until she whimpered and gasped. And then he withdrew, but only long enough to enter her with his thumb, holding her there and running the flat pad of two fingers up between her lips to find the hood of her clit. He squeezed. She cried out, and he immediately let go, frustrating her further when he did nothing more than coat her with her own juices, sweeping the fluid back from her vagina to rub in circles over the button of her ass. Anything. He could do anything. She ached with the need to come. She wanted him to take her any way, every way. But he didn't take her at all. He pulled back, and she straightened, frustration growling loudly from her belly up her throat. Damn you, Thomas Miller, she whispered, emotion clogging her throat. Behind her, Blue stood, nearly strangling on a desperate laugh. <laughs> Jess, you're still the whore all men want to find in their bed. Do you know that? She bristled and turned to face him, her breathing labored, her pulse racing. She looked up into his eyes, seeing the reflection of her own flashing as hotly as his, seeing a hunger that told her she could snap her fingers and bring him to his knees. The power she held over him thrilled her. It equaled the power he held over her. No, Blue. I'm only a whore in your bed, never in anyone else's. Chapter 6 He wanted to know what she meant. He couldn't believe any woman who loved sex the way Jesse did wouldn't act on her urges, respond with the same fire, no matter the man. He didn't want to believe her. He couldn't believe her. Believing her meant falling into whatever trap she'd come here to set. He'd never zipped up his fly after his earlier back porch fun, so he made quick work of skinning off his boxers and jeans. And then there he stood, naked in front of the only woman he'd ever wanted to marry. Anger warred with passion and lust, battled the sort of physical longing he hadn't experienced for years. In the end, he said nothing. He simply took her hand and took the two short steps from the dressing alcove into the outdoor shower. He turned on the water, adjusted the temperature until steam rose and billowed, backed up beneath the spray, and drew Jesse close. Her hands went around his back to cup his shoulder blades. She rested her head in the center of his chest and sighed. Gathering her hair into one hand, he slipped an arm around her, and then he stood there, afraid to move and hating himself for what felt like a monumental weakness. He was supposed to be long over this woman, but nothing had felt this right in years. Though he'd hoped the heat from his body would warm her, still Jesse shivered. He took another step back and turned to the side letting the water sluice over them both until the steam enveloped the enclosure, wrapping them in its fine mist. He didn't remember her being so small or so thin, and that physical fragility bared the claws of his protective instincts. It didn't matter that a cold day in hell would dawn before she came to a man for protection. She'd always made him feel like she needed him, and right now it was hard to separate those feelings from what was going on with him physically. What with her gorgeous breasts pressed to his chest and his cock throbbing where he'd shoved it against her belly. There where she wiggled and squirmed as if wanting to take him inside her however she could. The thought that she wanted him that much. He released a purely feral groan. 
and then he felt her grin where her mouth met his chest, right before her shivers became a full-body shake. He reached over and upped the flow of hot water. The water's not going to help, she said. I thought you were cold. She shook her head. No, I'm wonderfully warm. He stiffened and bit back a curse. Don't tell me you're scared. No, not scared. She snuggled in even closer. Never scared. He closed his eyes, unnaturally relieved and wanting nothing less than to examine the reason. You're still shaking. Her entire body trembled, and if her attempt at a laugh was intended to make him feel better, she failed. He felt as though he'd lost total control over the situation and what little was left of his mind. Believe me, I wish I could stop. This is not exactly the smooth seduction I'd planned. She lifted her head from his chest, tilted it back enough to look up into his eyes. All he saw were stars, the reflection of the ones in the sky and those sparked by what Jesse was feeling. She'd never been good at keeping things from him, which was why he'd felt poleaxed when she told him goodbye. He wished he had the strength to show her exactly how abandonment felt. Leaving her wet and trembling and naked in the dark would go a long way toward fulfilling the dream he'd once had of revenge. But he didn't have it anymore. And he didn't resent her anymore for never telling him the truth of why she'd left him. This woman was not that girl. She was so very much more. And only just now, with her breasts pressed to his body, her legs twined with his, only now with the way her hands massaged the very tired muscles in his back, did he realize he'd let the past anger go. This moment was about nothing more than the here and now. He lowered his head and kissed her. It was a fantasy kiss, a dream kiss, a kiss like so very few he'd shared in his life. It was a kiss of uncertain exploration, as if neither of them trusted anything about this moment or the rest of the night still to come. It was a soft kiss, gentle and tender, and his heartbeat roared in his ears. What a fool thinking making love with Jesse could be about revenge. She'd hurt him. He'd wanted to strike back. Now he wanted to do nothing more than make this night one neither of them would ever forget. He pulled free from the kiss and moved his mouth to the soft skin of her neck, tasting her there beneath her chin, along the line of her jaw, to the spot below her ear that he remembered so well. She gasped, as he'd expected, digging fingertips into his ribcage and tossing back her head. Blood surged to his groin, and he widened his stance, pressing his erection even harder into her belly's soft give. His hands slipped down to cup her bottom, his fingers reaching deep between her cheeks to tease her tender and intimate flesh. He wanted nothing more than to drop to his knees, to feast on her gorgeously ripe breasts, to lap and eat at her sex, to shove his tongue into her as far as he could and love her with his mouth until she exploded all over his face. But she stopped him before he could get his mouth anywhere near her luscious curves, stopped him by doing no more than stepping away putting a breath of space between their bodies and opening her mouth in the center of his chest. His hands went to her waist while her tongue swirled through the wet hair on his chest to find his nipples, one then the other, teething and tonguing skin and muscle until his eyes rolled back in his head. His cock strained upward, reaching for his belly, He'd grown so fucking hard he could barely move. It was not until he smelled more than wet skin and damp cedar that he realized Jesse had squirted a ribbon of shower gel in a line across his chest. She pushed him back out of the spray, 
pinning him to the wall as she went to work, massaging him with her fingertips, digging into the muscles of his chest and shoulders until he felt as if she'd nailed him in place. He couldn't move. He didn't want to move, afraid he'd distract her from the incredible job she was doing of washing away the years of sexual encounters he'd pretended were enough. She opened her palms then and spread the lather in ever-widening circles, moving down his torso to his abs and lower, her hands slipping down either side of his package into the crease of his thighs. She forced his legs open, urged his hips forward, rinsing him clean, and then she dropped to her knees, raining kisses back and forth between his thighs as the water pummeled down on her back. He damn sure didn't want her to choke before she got to where she was going, and then, oh god damn, but her hand was around his shaft, squeezing hard and stroking as her lips wrapped around his ripe, swollen head. He'd wanted to take care of her pleasure first, but she just made it impossible for him to think. All he could do was feel her hand like a glove and all that sweet pressure, her lips working madly to suck him dry. He thrust forward because he had to, thrust again before he could hold himself back. And when she urged his legs apart with her free hand, he gave up on anything resembling control and obeyed. She teased him without mercy, fingering the seam separating his balls and slipping behind, pressing hard against the skin stretched as taut as that of his cock. He ached, and his ball sack drew up, tightening around the stones of his testicles as Jesse's exploration reached deeper. And then nothing mattered anymore because he couldn't have stopped her or stopped himself. Ah, oh, Jess, he cried, his hands flat on the cedar wall at his sides, holding him upright as he filled her with his cock and his cum. Chapter 7 Wrapped in the circle of his arms and cushioned by the pallet he'd made on the floor, Jesse lay curled against Blue's body. His nearness warmed her, as did the roaring fire at their feet, and she grinned. What a sight. His mad dash through the house, gathering quilts and pillows while still in the buff, his dangly bits swaying in the breeze. While still in the backyard enclosure, She'd wanted more than anything to get into the hot tub with Blue, to straddle his body with jets of water pulsing all around. But once they stepped out of the shower's steam, Blue wasn't having any more of the water. He wanted her in bed. Back at the house, he'd started the fire, dragging every piece of bedding he owned to the hearth. She adored his total lack of self-consciousness. She always had. She loved his comfort with his bare body and the way his confidence put her equally at ease in her own state of undress. She was strangely satisfied, even without a single one of the orgasms she'd expected to have experienced by now. Tingly and frustrated, yes, but comfortable and content. For the moment, she couldn't imagine any other place she'd rather be. She was not being stupid. She was fully aware of the danger of deluding herself into thinking she and Blue had a future. As it was, when she left in the morning, she'd mourn losing him a second time. More than making Christmas memories, her time here had shown her that the sex between them was more than physical. It was the mating of souls she'd never know again. She scooted even closer, hooking a knee over his thigh, moving her head to the center of his chest, walking her fingers from his breastbone down his abdomen to his penis, which lay thick and soft on the pillow of his balls. She held him in her hand, enjoying the flaccid weight and the way he stirred anew at her touch, skating the flat of her palm 
from the base of his growing shaft to the head, she slipped down beneath to cup his testicles and marvel at the soft skin of his sack. One arm bent and cradling his head, Blue growled low in his throat, tucking her even closer with the arm around her back. Uh, my balls are going to be aching by the time you leave. I haven't had seen this much action since... Curious, Jesse picked up his trailing thought, blowing a stream of breath over his flat nipple before asking, Since when? He hesitated for several seconds, then huffed out a snort. Since that's none of your business, Miss Buchanan. Youch! He yelled when she tugged at a sprig of hair between his legs. Tell me, she demanded, knowing that the fantasy of Blue remembering the sex they'd shared as anything out of the ordinary was just that. A fantasy. Tell you what? He asked gruffly. How long it's been since I had sex? She thought about that for a moment, before admitting to herself that she had no rights at all where he was concerned. Stupid of me, I know. I don't know why I asked. Because you wanted to know? He chuckled then, but the sound seemed to be more a case of laughing at her than with her, or at any sort of shared joke. Then again, what did she expect? tramping off into territory beyond the physical terrain she'd come here to explore. Laughter was the least she deserved, she thought, sighing as she moved her hand away from his groin back up to his belly. She'd barely reached his navel when he stopped her, grabbing hold of her fingers and wrapping them around his half-hard penis. It's been a while, Jess, and even longer since it's been any good. He took a deep breath, exhaled, thrust lightly into her closed fist. When it got to the point where I did better by myself, I decided it wasn't worth the hassle. She wanted to feel victorious. All she felt was sad. Sad for Blue, and bitter that things couldn't have been different, and angry with the other women who hadn't loved him the way he deserved to be loved. And now here she was, doing the very same thing. I'm sorry. For what? The fact that I'm not getting any? He turned his head toward her, forced hers up, so her gaze met his. Don't be. It's my choice. And it's not like I've been in any danger of becoming a monk. She smiled at that, then cuddled her cheek back down on his chest. Tiny hairs tickled her lips and her nose. I know. I just feel like I failed you somehow. If I'd been here for you... But I guess that's rather conceited of me, isn't it? Thinking I had any impact... You had a lot of impact. More than I should have let you have, he added harshly. And then he shrugged. But what did I know? I was 18 and apparently didn't know much of anything beyond what grass seed sold best in what month. He cleared his throat and pulled her up onto his body, wrapping his arms around her back and twining his legs with hers. One thing I didn't get, Jess. I was so wrapped up in school and football in the store. He shook his head. One thing I wanted to kick my own ass for not seeing was how bad things were with your dad. No one saw it, or understood. You had to live it, to be there, to know what it was like. She trembled, not wanting to revisit the abuse that she'd suffered. She was beyond that now, and she would never go back. I missed my mother so much, but she was in a better place, not having to wonder when he'd go off, not having to bear the brunt of his tirades or his fists. Blue stroked his hands down her back, one then the other, as if his touch could soothe what was left of the pain. You should have told me. That pissed me off more than anything, hearing the gossip in the store. I wanted to hear it from you. Why? 
so you could take care of things? She shook her head. The vehemence of her conviction was impossible to hide. I had to take care of things myself. Leaving September was the only way I would ever feel strong enough to live my life my way. Not his. And, God, she hated to say it. Not your way. I couldn't risk that you would ask that of me. He held her tighter, saying nothing. She heard the click of his teeth as he ground his jaw. She felt his muscles tense along his neck, what with her head tucked up beneath his chin, and she wondered what he was thinking. His heartbeat thudded from his chest and into hers, where she lay atop his body. She raised her head, propped her chin on her laced hands, resting on his collarbone. I didn't want to leave you, but I had to get out. I had to go. I know you did, baby. I know. And then he held her quietly while they watched the fire, stroking her softly as if taking the past away. She'd missed his tenderness so very, very much. Missed the way he'd always had of making her feel so... special. As if she were the most precious thing in his busy life, the one part above all else that he needed to survive, that didn't have to be shared beyond the two of them, that required they meet no expectations, but those that were their own. She'd taken all of that away, no doubt hurting him in ways she couldn't imagine, and that one thing she would always regret, that, and the way coming back now had opened up those vulnerabilities again. Why had she selfishly not thought of what this weekend might do to Blue? How many mistakes could she possibly make when it came to this man? Still, she knew. They both had to know. That things had happened the only possible way for two 18-year-olds on divergent paths, whose lives had reached that big, fat fork in the road to adulthood. But here and now, she sighed, snuggling down into Blue's side. Those days belong to another lifetime. And this one was so much better. Finally, he said, You realize, don't you, that I've got you here naked and I'm still not getting any? She looked up into his eyes, beyond the teasing glint to the hint of uncertainty lurking behind. And I suppose you want me to do something about that? Actually, yeah... That would be pretty damn great, he said, his smile growing wide enough to show off the dimples she'd missed seeing. She pursed her lips, pretending to consider. I'm not so sure I agree. It seems that things have been a bit one-sided around here in the way they've been going down. He huffed. Think so, huh? And then he was on his all fours, kneeling over her, straddling her, and leaning down to kiss her full and hard on the lips. Before she could disentangle her arms or get more than a taste of the kiss she so wanted, he was drawing a line down the center of her body with his tongue. She let her hands fall back beside her shoulders, let her eyes close, and did nothing but feel. She felt the heaven of being naked beneath Blue's body and the magic of his mouth as he tickled and teased her with quick licks and nibbles, aroused her with long, lingering, open-mouthed kisses on her belly's soft swell. Her nipples grew tight, her breasts swollen. She desperately wanted him, his mouth, his hands, to ease away the ache to give her a taste of the pleasure her life had been missing for such a very long time. But when she cupped her own hands to the sides of her breasts, kneading the fullness, pinching at her nipples with forefingers and thumbs until her breathing quickened and came in sharp, panting bursts, Blue suddenly stopped. She opened her eyes to find him staring down at her with a fiery gaze. What's wrong? He shook his head. Christ, but you're beautiful. 
You don't have to flatter me to get laid, you know. It was so much easier to flirt and to tease than to be overtaken by the rush of emotion evoked by his words. An emotion she didn't want to feel. Because in fewer than 24 hours, she'd be on her way home. I thought you might have learned to accept a compliment by now, he said softly. Reminding her of how many times and in how many ways he'd soothed her with nothing more than his voice. She blinked back tears. She didn't want to cry and gave him a wry smile instead. I'm not sure that will ever happen. He spent a long moment staring into her eyes. A moment during which Jessie had to force herself to remain still. To breathe slowly and calmly to not reach for him the way she so wanted to do. She should have known she could never escape this weekend without involving more than her body. Now what? She refused to buy into the hope that he was involving more, too. A hope that grew the longer he remained silent, flippant and teasing she could handle. Mindless sex she could handle. A second round of broken hearts would be too much to bear. What are you looking at? She finally asked when it seemed he had no intention of looking away. What? He frowned. You mean you don't want to know what I'm thinking? Contrary to popular women's magazines, men can use both heads at the same time. She arched a brow. Read a lot of Cosmo, do you? Only the covers and checkout lines. Hmm... I didn't know the Maxi Mart was so progressive. What's with you, Jess? You used to take sex between us seriously. His frown got to her, and she shook her head, frightened to death of admitting the truth, but knowing a dose of honesty between them would give leaving more of a pleasant aftertaste. I have a great life, Blue. I love my job and have incredible friends. The money's great. If I want to travel, I do. If I want to shop, I don't think twice about my budget. There's only one thing I don't have. A man. No, actually, I do have a man. A very nice man. Kind and stable and successful. Well, isn't that special? He rolled off of her and onto his back. She shifted up to lean over him. It would be... Except when he kisses me, I feel nothing. And when he fucks you? She shook her head. I haven't slept with him yet. He's being very patient. He huffed at that. Sounds like a saint. He is. This time, Jessie was the one to roll away, to pull her uncertainties around her. And he deserves a woman who can appreciate him, not one obsessed with sex. Doesn't appear to me as if you're obsessed at all. But I am. When we're out, all I can think about is what it would be like to sleep with him, to take him home to bed. God, what was wrong with her? How unfair is it that when I fake even enjoying his kiss, he's everything I've ever wanted, and he leaves me totally cold. Blue raised up, loomed over her, his expression burning with a possessive, primal heat. So, you came to me to get off? No, Blue. I can get myself off just fine. I've been doing it for years. I came to you to see if I'm as unresponsive as I seem to be. If it's me. Or if it's them. And now for the big confession. Or if you're the only one who will ever be able to make me come. Why don't we find out? He asked after a long, tense silence. And then he lowered his head. Chapter 8 Her mouth was unbelievably giving and warm. She parried to every thrust of his tongue. And he couldn't believe she had any doubt about her sexuality. He'd never known a woman admit to loving sex the way Jesse Buchanan loved sex. With her hands gripping his shoulders, 
he kissed her hard, ruthless in his intention to make her feel anything, everything, to figuratively tear her to pieces, to make her understand the truth of what they shared, the depth of their connection, to make her feel what she did to him. He wanted her to know that he'd spent all these years hating her because no one else had ever delivered on the physical promises she'd made. And he wanted to get that back. When he tore his mouth from hers, she gasped and gasped again. When he moved down her body and curled his tongue around first one pebbled nipple, then the other. Back and forth he suckled, drawing on her areolas with his lips, teething her gently until she cried out and writhed. He took her breasts in his hands, pressing the plump orbs together, breathing in the scent of her arousal when he nuzzled and lapped at her skin. He wanted to straddle her chest, pump in and out of the soft valley until his balls retracted into his body and he shot his hot load. He'd loved fucking her tits, and remembered too well the look in her eyes as she'd waited, as she'd watched. Her lips parted in anticipation, as if she wanted his cock in her mouth more than she wanted to breathe. Even now, blood surged and he thrust forward, the head of his cock sliding along her soft inner thigh. Her hands moved down his sides and she reached between their bodies. He backed up and away before she took him into her hand. The fire behind him popped and crackled, bathing Jessie's skin in flickering light. He slid farther down her body, kissing his way around her navel and over the swell of her belly until he reached the patch of black hair neatly trimmed above the soft lips of her pussy. Kneeling between her spread legs, he placed both hands on her thighs and opened her farther, loving the way her juices glistened in the flickering light, like clear crystal sugar coating pink silk. And the sweetness was all his. He moved closer, breathing deep of her scent that was salty and warm and caused the fire in his groin to surge hotter. He closed his eyes against the new pressure opened them again once he found his control and then he dipped his head stuck out his tongue and pushed it into her gorgeous cunt she cursed loudly and cried out his name he swirled his tongue inside her pulling out to slide the flat from her hole between her labia and up to her clit once there he drew the hard knot between his lips sucking it into his mouth to flick with the tip of his tongue. She spread her legs wider, drawing up her knees and pushing up onto her elbows to watch. Her dark eyes reflected the flames from the fire and sparked with a consuming need. He couldn't wait for her to burn him alive. He wet two fingers with his mouth and, as her eyes flared, pushed them inside her lowering his head to lap and to suck, teasing her clit with soft touches and harder strokes while fingering her in the steady rhythm he knew she loved. Christ, but she was wet. He couldn't help it. He reared back onto his knees and spread her juices over the head of his cock. She whimpered, watching as he gave himself pleasure, and he was almost unable to stop from coming. He closed his eyes and reached behind his balls, pressing upward against the surge. And then he felt Jessie's fingers tangling with his as she took over applying the pressure he needed, wrapping her other hand tightly around his shaft while his breathing settled and he found his control. Of course, then it was all he could do to pry her hands away and push her down to her back. I love your body, Blue, she breathlessly whispered, clenching her hands into fists where he held her wrists to the floor. I've barely had you, and already know I'll never get enough. He gritted his teeth until his jaw ached from holding himself in check. 
and then he reached for a condom. He sat back, hooked his hands behind her knees, and pulled her forward, draping the backs of her thighs over his. She wiggled even closer, wide open and waiting, her hands reaching down to part her folds and invite him in. The invitation was impossible to resist. He took hold of his cock with one hand, guiding himself forward, leaning his weight on his other hand, spread flat on the floor at the side of her head. She sucked in a sharp breath as the head breached her opening, and then her eyes rolled back, her lids fluttered, and her lower body drove up to meet his. The ride was wild. He kept his hand between their bodies, fingering her clit as he pumped to the rhythmic grip of her tight inner walls. Heaven. Pure heaven. She wrapped her legs high around his waist and forced him down, and then one hand was digging into his backside, the other holding his head and pulling him down for her kiss. Her mouth devoured his even as her body demanded all he had to give. She was slick and hot, and she made it impossible for him to hold back. He couldn't hold back. Not when he was here, between her legs, where he'd never had a reason to deny the urges that drove them both equally. He swallowed her whimpers and urgent cries, matching each of her upward thrusts with his own downward motion, withdrawing until only the head of his cock remained clutched within her tight sheath. Christ, she was sweet. Unbelievably sweet. And hotter than he'd known a woman could be. And then she burst, releasing her hold on him and flinging her arms out to the side. Her upper body came off the floor, her head lolled back, her heels dug into the backs of his thighs. He watched her come, caught unaware by her uninhibited exhibition, by the way she lost herself in the orgasm, the total and reckless abandon of her physical response. That was all it took. He shoved forward into her body as far as he could, spilling his seed and flirting with the dark edge of consciousness with each shuddering stroke. She soothed her hands down his back, her body shuddering with silent sobs that threatened to take him apart. He finally pulled himself free from her body, pulled off the condom, and tossed it into the fireside trash before wrapping Jessie in blankets and spooning her limp body with his. Once his breathing had settled and her pulse no longer raced, he tucked loose strands of hair behind her ear. Does that answer your question? He asked, knowing he'd just been handed a mighty big truth, a truth ten years in coming. All this time come and gone, and he'd been fooling himself into thinking he'd gotten over this woman. Or that he ever would. Yes, she said with tears in her eyes. It does. Yet he had the feeling that neither one of them was the least bit happy with their answers and that when she left a few hours from now, his shield of bitterness would return. He figured he was going to need it, or else he'd spend the rest of his life wondering why they could never get this right. Chapter 9 Wearing red flannel pajamas and wrapped in a soft woolen throw patterned with gaily wrapped presents and trees, Jessie peeled back the plastic wrap covering her popcorn ball and settled back with a DVD of Bill Murray's Scrooged. Appropriate for Christmas Eve, she supposed, since she wasn't feeling the least bit ho-ho-ho jolly or gay. What she was feeling was simply impatient, wanting the holidays over and gone so she could get back to the wonderful life she'd bragged about to Blue. And it was wonderful, just lacking in passion, and void of orgasms she didn't supply. She missed him. She hated to admit it, but saw no way around the truth. Blue Miller had grown into a hell of a man, the very man who would always hold a place in her heart, 
For now, that put a relationship with anyone else out of the question. For how long, she couldn't say. Definitely not until these feelings faded to a memory, if they ever did. One she'd be able to look back on fondly, instead of wishing circumstances had been different. And she'd been able to stay in September and live her life with Blue. He'd never said anything leading her to believe he wanted her there. But then, when had she given him a chance? When had they talked over anything that mattered? Why hadn't she made the effort after she realized how much of what they'd shared still remained? Easy enough answer. Because this time she was afraid of being the one rejected. A light rap on her door caught her with her attention drifting between the movie and the tree she'd spent hours decorating in white, pink, and gold. She closed her eyes, ground her jaw, determined to send her well-meaning friends on their way. She was alone. She was not lonely. And she did not need to be smothered in holiday cheer. With her popcorn ball held in one hand and the other dragging the throw behind her, she readied her growling response and pulled open the door. And there stood the very presence she would have begged for if she'd had a chance to sit on Santa's lap. Blue stood in her doorway wearing boots and jeans, along with a shearling coat and black cowboy hat that made him seem even larger than he already was, which made Jessie feel small and ridiculously feminine and protected and safe. Her heart ached, beating so hard and so fast she thought her ribs would break. Tears welled in her eyes. Joy made a fist in her throat. Her popcorn ball fell in crushed pieces to her feet. He glanced down at the sugary pink and white mess. I guess it's safe to assume you're speechless in a good way, and not that you're thinking up a way to tell me to get the hell out of here. Why was he still standing in her doorway instead of holding her in his arms? Yes, I mean, no, don't leave. Come in, please, come in. He did, stepping over the threshold, shoving the door closed behind him and sweeping her up into a crushing bear hug. And then she was in his arms and in his lap on the sofa, staring into his face because she couldn't believe he was here, in Dallas. In her condo, on Christmas Eve, when she thought she'd be stuck spending the rest of the night with Bill Murray. What are you doing here? She asked, cupping his face in both of her hands, because she still didn't trust that she hadn't dozed off and was dreaming. But he was warm, except where he was cold, and he was bristly with needing to shave. You left without getting what you'd come for he said, digging down into one of his coat pockets. What was he talking about? Hadn't she learned exactly what she'd needed to know? That no man but Blue Miller would ever be able to make her feel this way because he was the only man she would ever be able to love? He handed her a black velvet jewelry box. Her hands shook almost too hard to hold it. What's this? Why don't you open it? Because she was scared to death to know what it was? Frightened out of her mind that she'd never again experience this feeling of pure amazement? She lifted the lid of the hinged box and then looked into Blue's eyes as she worked to catch her breath between sobs. I was going to bring you a real one from the farm, he said, lifting the silver filigree chain from the box and fastening the catch beneath her hair at her nape. But I didn't want to have to deal with decorations and lights and all the rest of that crap. Wait, I can't see it. She tucked her chin to her chest, doing her best to peer down at the tiny emerald Christmas tree with a diamond star on top. Oh, Blue, this is gorgeous and so unexpected and way too extravagant. He shook his head. Not extravagant at all. Maybe not for a wife or a girlfriend, but for an ex-lover or a one-night stand? She gave him a tight smile. Definitely too much. Well, that's the thing, 
he said, fingering the jeweled charm where it rested in the V of her pajamas lapels. I thought maybe we could work something out to remedy that X part. She blinked once, twice, a third time, uncertain that she was hearing him correctly. You're asking me to be your lover? That, yes. And he took a deep breath, and she saw in his hesitation the hurt she'd inflicted all those years ago. She opened his coat and laid her hands on his chest, over his heart, because it was all she knew to do. Ask me, Blue, please. We messed up somewhere, Jess. We were too young, I guess. I didn't understand shit about why you had to leave. Why you wouldn't let me be your protector. He brushed hair back from her face. I wanted to be your protector. I wanted to be your lover. And I still do. Is that a proposal? I know we have a lot to work out. And we might not be able to anyway. Yes. He frowned. Yes, we have a lot to work out. Or, yes, we might not be able to. Or, yes, I want to try again. And, yes, I know it won't be easy and will mean a lot of work. But I really do like working on you, Blue Miller. Is that so? Oh, yeah. And she got busy showing him exactly how much, shoving his jacket back off his shoulders and tackling his shirt buttons as she shrugged out of the thick shearling and swayed. She went after his belt buckle next, feeling his erection rise beneath her fingers, which weren't quite as nimble as she wished. Her body opened in response, shifting and swelling in sharp anticipation, a reaction that was solely connected to what she shared with Blue. She remained in his lap, forced to catch her balance on the sofa arm when he raised his lower body and tugged jeans and drawers down his hips, only far enough to free the goods tucked inside. She took hold of his thick shaft and lightly squeezed, her knuckles rubbing into the hair on his flat belly. He scrunched up his abs behind her hand and shivered, releasing a bead of clear fluid from the tip of his plump, ripe head. Jessie licked her lips, and Blue groaned like a dying man. She caught the tip of her tongue with the edges of her teeth and raised her gaze to his, smearing his release in a circular motion over the flat of his cock's swollen head. Blue? Jess? He ground out, his eyes flashing, his fingers unbuttoning her pajama top. Cool air brushed her bare skin and she trembled. Are we safe? She closed her eyes, breathed, tried again. I'm on the pill. I've had blood tests done annually for the last three years, since the last time I was intimate with a man. The admission hurt. She didn't want him to know anything in her past. But she was not a stupid woman. I want to make love with you desperately, but I don't have a single condom in the house. Blood surged through his veins. His cock pulsed in her hand. You haven't had sex for three years? She shook her head. And until last weekend, I hadn't made love in ten. Lift up, he ordered, holding her balanced on one knee while she pulled the other leg free from her pants. And then he settled her back to straddle his lap cupping her mound with one shaking hand. I'm safe, Jess. I've been tested, and I've never been without a condom. I have a pocket full of them now. We only used half of what you brought. Heat rose from her collarbone to infuse her face, deepening further when he cleared his throat and added, I want to love you, to come inside you with nothing in the way. No secrets. No doubts. When she rose up onto her knees, Blue pressed her breasts together and buried his face between. She rubbed the head of his cock the length of her slit, teasing the both of them mercilessly with their shared heat 
and then she guided him to her opening and slid down, burying him to the hilt. She sat there in his lap, unmoving, his cock so deep inside of her she felt as if they were one. And they were. One flesh. One heart. Exactly as they'd always been. Blue threaded his hand into her hair and cupped the back of her head, his gaze red and watery as he pulled her to his kiss. Merry Christmas, Jesse Buchanan, he whispered against her lips. I love you. Oh, Blue, I love you too, she said, thinking Elvis didn't know a damn thing about the meaning of a blue Christmas.